What is up? Enjoying your blended family. Welcome back to another episode. And today I am going to have a very special guest with a very specific blended family dynamic. And in this uh, podcast today, my heart is really for you to hear uh, her love story and really how it ended up turning out for her, but then how she has come through and really made the best of it in her co-parenting journey for her for her child, for her family. Uh, her name is Jessica Fru, and she is the co-host of Husband-in-Law Podcast. I've been binge watching slash, I guess, listening to these episodes over the last several weeks. And we're going to be discussing a topic that honestly, in my previous life, my past life, I would have avoided like the plague because it can be very controversial, especially if you are a believer and you have your certain viewpoints on things. I am hoping today she's going to shed some light. So I'm going to stop being coded here and just let you know just a little bit before, um, before I bring her on. She was married previously and her husband ended up while they were married coming out of the closet and expressing um, really what, what was going on internally for him. And that shook her world. It rocked it. And then she had to figure out how they were going to put the pieces back together. And I know for a fact that there are multiple families in our blended family community here that are walking through this same season of life. So I don't think it is fair for us to act like it is not a thing. Um, but I don't, I also don't want to act like I have all the right answers because um, I know God and I love God, but I am not God. And so I am here just to simply listen, observe, and hear, ask questions, and then shed some light on this for anybody walking through it, that there is hope um, for you and for your family. And so we will get into it right after this. When we first became a step family, just like you, we didn't quite know what we were getting into. Scarlett and Randall Tandy here from Enjoying Your Blended Family, and we have been a blended family for over 15 years. And not only did we have to figure out how to handle the day-to-day -day struggles that come with being in a step family, about seven years in, our biggest fear happened and each of our kids went to go live with their other parent. We went through seasons of zero connection with each one of our kids, and we had to get really creative on ways to reestablish and reconnect those relationships. And through prayer and becoming very intentional, God restored our family in, in true God-like fashion and made it better than we could have ever imagined or hoped for. So God has called us to help other families do the same thing, to make those connections. So if you're looking for stronger relationships, deeper connections, and more communication, then we believe it truly starts with being intentional and creating these fun opportunities in our family. Click the link so that you can get quick access to the process that we use to help you find common interests in your family so that you can be more intentional on spending time with your kids, your spouse, and your family as a whole. We believe you can take the step out of step family and create a blended family that you truly enjoy. You can find our podcast on Enjoying Your Blended Family on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And while you're sitting there, go ahead and follow us on social media. So when you have more fun, you'll see less problems. All right. Welcome back. And so I want to start out first just saying thank you, Jessica, for being on the podcast and be willing to be an open book and for everything that you are doing with the husband-in-law podcast and the ministry really that you have set out with families, women, men that are walking through this season of life because so many people would rather put it in a box or put a curtain over it, dust it under the rug and say, don't talk about this. This is off limits. This is wrong or this is that and put labels on it. And then it leaves a whole community of people just feeling shame, um, embarrassment, like they're all alone, hopeless. And so I just want to say thank you for that first. And then will you just give us a little bit of your current family dynamics? What does it look like? What makes up your blended family? 
Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And it's interesting listening to you introduce this. Like I felt the same way a long time ago of this isn't something, well, first of all, I just didn't think of it as ever something I would be dealing with or have to think about. And now I'm like in the thick of it. So <laughs> my current family, I have, I was married to my first husband for 10 years. I mean, seven years. And then we divorced. We had a daughter together. She is now 14. She was two when we got divorced, which just blows my mind that it's been that long. Um, and we co-parent together. We are still really good friends. I have been remarried now for 10 years and I have a stepdaughter who is 15. So my daughter's 14, my stepdaughter's 15 and my stepson is 17. And at this point, my daughter and stepdaughter basically live with us full time. My stepson lives with his mom full time and it works beautifully for us. It has been a long road, a lot of heartache, a lot of pain uh, and a lot of growth and understanding who we are. Uh, we have a really good relationship with my ex-husband in the fact that we still do holidays together and we spend birthdays together. Like even his birthday is at my house with my family and all of those things. Uh, he has a partner now, a boyfriend who has been around for a couple of years and he is very much a part of our family as well. And we have a very different relationship with my husband's ex-wife where, you know, it's email only for communication and pick up and drop off. I mean, kids drive now and things like that, but pick up and drop off was done in the church parking lot before and after church and nobody approached each other's cars and things like that. So we get both sides of the dynamic of dealing with exes and working through that. And we also get how it feels to blend a family and the crazy, amazing process that is. Yeah. And did you say how long that y'all have been, that you've been remarried? 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Okay. Um, it's like I was listening and then I get so caught, like I start asking questions to myself in my head. So I do love uh, that you do have such a wide perspective of both sides of it as well, and that you've been in it for a while. So you've seen mm -hmm. things that work and things that don't work. And really, I think once you get to a certain spot, you're just tired of being frustrated or angry or sad or whatever. And you're just like, come on, can we just like get along? And your personality is so bubbly and bright. Um, if you're watching on the YouTube, you can tell by her background or if you follow <laughs> um, Jessica on her social media. And did I say your last name right? Brew? Yeah, you did. You nailed okay. it. Brew. Awesome. Yep. So um, yeah, go check out her Instagram for sure. It's Hey Jessica Fru. Is it Instagram and TikTok or? Um, Instagram, mostly Instagram. I have a little bit on TikTok. I've kind of let that go for a while. So you want it's me to go to Instagram? Up. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep up with all the stuff. But yeah, she she has a lot going on, a lot of different ways to support you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. If you're listening today and you're like, oh my gosh, um, I need this in my life, especially with the podcast, go binge listen to her episodes like I was doing. And so again, just to set the scene a little bit more, and I guess where my heart is coming from and where I want families to go today because I don't know when you said when you the way you introduced it or whatever you're hearing it from you know outsiders perspectives as well and I've come from a now I wouldn't say like completely like legalistic it wasn't like I come from a Methodist background but it also mm -hmm. and they're going through their whole thing right now too as far as um, what's acceptable what's not acceptable um, but as I grew up I truly believed if you didn't do everything the Bible said you were supposed to do correctly, you were going to hell. And I got pregnant in high school. I ended up divorced. So I thought I was doomed to hell. And I just tried to work and work and work doing everything good that I could possibly do. Hopefully, so that day when I was face to face with God, he would say, okay, well, I guess you have outdone your wrongs now. So I'll let you in. Um, and it wasn't until I understood a relationship, um, with God through Jesus Christ that I understood that I had been forgiven for all of my past, present, and future mistakes that I would be making. And I realized that that law came and showed me that there is no way we are all imperfect human beings that are making mistakes all the time. So I just wanted to lay some, a little bit of foundation for anyone that's listening today. That's like, Christians can be very mean and very hateful. It's, it's so sad. I'm like, who do you think you're winning over for the kingdom when you are so judgmental and so harsh yeah. 
area. And so this is one of those topics, even for us being a blended family ministry, like how dare you involve God in this because you're going to hell because you remarried. And I, I feel like these two categories get lumped together because someone who remarries or someone who is living a homosexual lifestyle, they're choosing to stay in that, which means they're choosing to continue to sin, which means that God will not forgive them kind of thing. And so that's where I think a lot of people want to shy away from this, because if we talk about it, then it means we're saying, yeah, you know, like, you know, everything is um, whatever you want to do. But then at the same time, as a mother who has with each of my kids at different points have had questioning identity issues and all of that. And I had to decide as a mother, if this is part of their story, part of our family, I choose to love my child regardless of what is, you know, their decisions that they're making. I do not want to be the woman that I admired growing up that had no relationship with her son because of the choices, the lifestyle, whatever that she disagreed mm -hmm. with, that she completely cut him off. So for me as a mom, I chose, I'm going to love regardless. I'm going to keep showing up. I want relationship regardless. And I believe that's how God, our father sees us. He wants to be in relationship. Um, and yes, there are things that he thinks are an easier road or a best plan that he has for us, but his heart is to be in connection, whatever that looks like. So that's just, I wanted to like bleh, all of that. <laughs> and your story is so powerful because I think y'all were in the church and trying to do everything the way that you felt like you were supposed to do things. And it ended up causing a, a lot more heartache, I think, in the end. So I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to invite you, Jessica, to tell your story. If you'll start with y'all's love story and then I'll interject mm -hmm. if there's more questions that I have. But I know, like, um, just feel free to share just that journey that y'all went on from the time of y'all y'all falling in love to him, admitting these things that are going on within himself. And then how did y'all pick up the pieces after that and move on? Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the interesting points that you bring up here is like, we think about the Bible and what it says to do and not to do and all these things. I'm like, the Bible is loaded with so much crazy stuff. And then we have interpreted that to be, to mean like what we think it should be or what we think it's supposed to be. And so people get into like Bible bashing or like who's correct. And I always just come to, back to Christ and I'm like, I don't know this is about being right or wrong or any of that. I think it's more about learning to love people who are different than us and who believe differently than us because you're hundred percent right. Like nobody's willing to come unto Christ or anything if they don't feel loved. Like why would they come out of shame or guilt or any of those things they are coming out of love because they feel hope, they feel joy, they feel all of those things. So, okay, going to my story. So my ex-husband and I met when we were in college. I was a vocal performance major and I had to go to this concert one night and I was just like, I do not want to be here. I'm sitting at this choir concert. I'm about to stand up to leave. I was required to be there for my, my major. And I was like, I'm just going to find something else to go to. And I was getting up to leave and this whole group of women ladies come walking down the aisle and I'm like, okay, I can't leave yet. And they all start filing into the row in front of me and sitting down. And at the end of this group of women, there's this one tall, good looking dude. And he sits down next to me because there wasn't room for him on the row. And I was like, all right, I guess I'll stay like this just got better. I'll hang out. And he like, we, you know, chatted back and forth during songs and stuff. And by the end of the night, he had my phone number and he called me the next day to go out with him. And we were together every day after that, that we could be. And we met in February, we got married in December and it was just so great. We had so much fun together and people talk about like how the first year of marriage is the hardest and all these things. And we just didn't have that. Like we, you know, we moved in together and it just all felt right and easy. That being said, <laughs> Steve had my ex-husband had disclosed to me a little bit before we got married that he struggled with pornography, which in the Mormon church is very much frowned upon. And, and I was like, you know what? I just feel like this isn't like, I'm okay with that. I'm grateful that you're honest with me about it. This isn't something that I, I'm really concerned about. Um, and then six months into our marriage, 
he was off at work one day and I had opened up our laptop and was looking for something. And this was like the time of like pop-ups when pop-ups like were just constant. And all of this pornography started popping up on the computer. And I was like, oh, great. Like, I don't want to see this. And I'm exiting out. And then I'm like, this is all men. Like, there are no women in these videos. And I was like, what is going on here? And so I realized literally there were no women anywhere to be found in anything that was coming up. And I was like, okay, I know some straight men might look at gay porn, heterosexual or homosexual porn, but I really felt in my gut that my husband was gay. And he came home that night and he could tell I was visibly upset, like, and he knew instantly what was going on. And he had convinced himself because he'd been raised in the Mormon church, LDS, conservative Christian religion, that he, uh, it was better to look at women or to look at just men. So he wasn't disrespecting women. He felt that like, this is the story he'd convinced himself of because he was in such denial about who he was. And I was like, okay, sure. But I knew like tucked away. I'm like, my husband is gay. Like I, I know he's gay. Uh, a couple years later, he was in counseling with an LDS Mormon Christian counselor. And the counselor's like, you know, these things are issues. I, I can see where you're coming from. But the real issue is, is that you're gay and you aren't able to love yourself for that. Like you're not accepting who you are. And until you love and accept yourself fully, these other things are going to continue to be an issue. So at that point in our relationship, he came out to me and like officially he could say the words, we could talk about it. Um, he could say, I'm gay. And we both decided, you know, we were really happy. And he said, this is always the life I'd planned on to be married to a woman, to have kids. And I want to do things right. I think, you know, he, he was very much of the mindset. He could pray the gay away. I never bought into that idea. I firmly believed that people are gay. They come that way. They're created that way. And I know that can create all sorts of arguments. I understand that these are my own personal beliefs. Um, and I watched him for years in our marriage, try to be perfect. And he very much, I mean, he was amazing. He was so involved in church. He did all of the things. He had served a mission for our church. He um, leaned into scripture study and prayer. And he was going out like we we lived on an island for a while in Belize, which is a whole nother story. But we basically led that congregation. And he would take role during church. And anybody who wasn't at church that day, we would then go out and and find them and invite them into the evening session of church and all of these things. Like he was in it, man, and determined that he could make this go away. And after a while, he realized this, this isn't going to work. Then he was in support groups through the church and all of these things. And he started losing hope that this would ever go away because he's hearing all these stories of people who tried for years and they were still unhappy because of this. Um, and so he actually ended up dropping that group partially because of that. He's like, this isn't filling with hope. It's like filling with, I'm scared. I'm worried. Um, he ended up, we, we ended up living in Oklahoma. And after we'd been there for a few months, he ended up having an affair with a man. And he told me pretty quickly after, like within a week and, um, everything shifted at that point. He was no longer attracted to me. He's like, Jessica, I just thought I could, get this out of my system. Like I would do it once and I would feel so gross and so repelled and disgusted with myself that I would be okay. Like that, that feeling would be enough for me that God would like, give me this feeling of this is not right. And I would have it then and know that. And he's like, outside of the fact that I know I have just hurt you incredibly and damaged our relationship in ways I can never repair. I, he's like, it felt like one of the most right things I've ever done. And it was so interesting to, as his wife to sit here and hear this. And also I knew it wasn't about me. And I knew that he was that he was being honest with me, that this is genuinely what he felt and where he was at. At that point, we tried to make it work for a while. He's like, I don't want this still, even though it felt right. Like I want to be with you. So we tried to make it work and it was a mess. Like we were a disaster. So finally we ended up divorcing. Um he moved in with the guy he had the affair with within a month or two, and we were divorced. I, this happened Labor Day weekend. We were divorced by December. 
And then he came back. I I had moved to Boise to be owned a house there. My family was there. So I moved back to Boise and lived in our house. And he's like, I can't do this. Like, this isn't right. I can't be without you. I don't know who I am without the church. And I need to be closer to Penny. So we dated again after we were divorced for like six months. And it was another complete disaster, but also gave us the clarity we needed that we had made the right decision. Not being together was what was right for both of us. And it was it was killing Steve inside to try to deny this, to try to show up as something he wasn't um, to the extent that for several years, probably like five years after our divorce, I slept with my phone on every night because Steve was dealing with suicidal thoughts. And I let him know that like my phone is on. If you are ever not OK, please, please call me. And he did a few times during the night and I still get emotional about it hearing his voice on the other line just being like I'm done I remember one specific time he was out he had just taken off running at like two in the morning and he's in the rain and he's like I'm I'm done I um I just need to end this you and Penny will be better without me and having to talk him into going back home getting in bed I'm like please go get in bed with your boyfriend and um so that you have somebody there and please call me in the morning. If I don't hear you by hear from you by the certain time, I will be sending somebody to your house. And so I, I know how real this is, is really what I'm getting at and how hard this is and the shame he carried for years because he came out and because he ruined our family is what he'd been told and believed. And now he no longer believes that, which I am so grateful. I'm like, I'm not going to give you the power to ruin my life or to ruin our family. I have the power. I'm the only one that has that power. So we made a plan for what our divorce would look like and how we wanted our lives to look like moving forward and really laid it out there, um, including down to like, would our daughter be raised in the church and all of those types of things. And Steve always has said, he's like, listen, I want our daughter to be like you. And I know part of the reason you are the way you are is because of the church and your beliefs in there. Um, and so I support you in that, which is a gift. I, I know not many people get that, like that can go either way. And so we really have been intentional about that. And even in who our partners that we've brought into this, we've really made sure and kind of been aware of how they fit into this and if they can feel comfortable and Steve and Matt, my husband and ex-husband, actually met at church when Steve and I were dating again. We all moved into the same church congregation, and they had been mountain biking together and stuff. So they knew each other before Matt and I started dating. And Matt, I met him one day when they were leaving mountain biking. And I told Steve a week later, I said, I'm going to marry Matt Frew. And he's like, you literally have said hi to that man. And I'm like, I know. And I used to make fun of people for this, but I swear I'm going to marry him. I don't know why I feel that way. And so I asked Matt out and like went after him. We hung out a couple of times. And then he's like, listen, I am super flattered and I really enjoy hanging out with you. But I'm dating another girl named Jessica and I'm far enough into it that I need to see where it goes. And I don't feel like I can date both of you um, out of respect to both of you. Like it's not, it's not right at this point. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I was like, let me know when you break up with her. I think we'd have a really good time together. And every few months I would tell him that I'd be like, all right, well, let me know when you break up with her. I think we'd have lots of fun together. And then finally one day he broke up with her and he asked me out the next day and we got married eight weeks later. Like it was insane and totally nuts, but that's what we did. And I've I've looked back on it because the first few years of mine and Matt's marriage were the hardest years of my life. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And also, I know how hard it is to blend families. I know how hard it is to marry again after you've been through hard things in your relationships even if you think you've healed through most of it, like Matt was, he had thought he'd healed through a lot of what had happened with his ex-wife and the traumas she had put him through. And it like all resurfaced when we married. And he was like, he didn't tell me this until we were recording our podcast. But he's like, I was just so determined that it was going to fail, that I was just doing everything to just get it done with. He's like, no, not that I was blatantly trying to be mean or anything, but subconsciously, 
I just wasn't putting the effort in because I was like, if it's going to end, it might as well end sooner than later. And literally from the day we got married, I could feel this shift in him. I remember on our honeymoon crying the last night of our honeymoon, just being like, what just happened? And we had a fun honeymoon together, but there was something wrong. Um, and he said, I remember one day Penny and I were leaving for a trip that was Matt was supposed to come with me on. And he's like, I watched from the window as you and Penny got ready to go on this trip and you'd put Penny in the car. She was like three years old at this point. She's itty bitty. It's like, you got her in her car seat and stuff. And you went to the back of the car and you leaned over like the back bumper with your hands on it and just sobbed. And he's standing there watching this from the window, which I had no idea. And he's like, I remember thinking at this point, what am I doing to this poor woman? Like, how can I do this to her? Um, but yeah, it continued for quite a while and mm -hmm. about, and I mean, I made plenty of mistakes in this of like, I gave up who I was those first few years of our marriage. Like I was grasping at straws, especially the first year to try to prove to everybody that I was worth having around. Basically, I could do this stepmom thing. I could show up for his ex-wife. I could, um, be the wife he wanted and needed. And it was at the expense of myself and probably in ways of my relationship with my daughter, because I would be like, oh, well, I can do this for your kids. Penny will be fine because, you know, she knows like, anyway, like, you know how that goes in your head. Yeah. And, um, I left him a year into our marriage. I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Um, and so one night at like two in the morning, I literally wrote a note. I took just a couple things and I was like, I'll be back for the rest of my stuff, but this just needs to be over. Like, I can't, I'm losing who I am. I am so gone, which isn't me. Like, I am not somebody who loses myself, but in this moment, I had allowed myself to be diminished and lost. And I leaned into what I call perfect partner syndrome, where we're trying to prove our worth. We're trying to do everything perfectly. So the other person will stay and want us. And I talked to my church leaders, who was this gentleman who is still one of our biggest, like, well, one of our best friends. And he's like, I know you don't want to go back. And he's like, but I want you to think about going back. And I was like, Ugh. <laughs> and I also knew in myself that I couldn't, I knew Matt and I were so good together. Like I knew the potential there and like the potential isn't always something to focus on. Like that's not enough to keep you to stay. But I was like, I need to try this a different way. And if it works, I will stay. If it doesn't, I'm out. But I knew I needed that for my own clarity and well-being. So I went back in the determination to show up for myself first, for my daughter, for myself for my daughter and then everything else. It meant Sunny some hard boundaries. It meant no longer engaging with his ex-wife. I had been calling her to like meet us at the pool when we had our kids during the summer and, and meet me at the gym. We'd go work out together and all of these things. And I was like, I can't do this because every time I do, things are twisted and I'm thrown under the bus and there's huge arguments between her and Matt and the kids. And I'm like, I'm out. And I know, I knew that wasn't really my fault. I just knew that it was for some reason creating this issue. So I stepped back and that was really hard for everybody of realizing, oh, like Jessica's not going between and Jessica's not going to be the one showing up to pick up the kids. And I'm not the one to um, do pickups and drop-offs or call at the last minute and be like, hey, this emergency came up. Will you do this? And I'm like, I'm out. And I wasn't completely out, but I set firm boundaries around that. If my daughter needed to be picked up, I wasn't calling somebody else to pick her up. I was going to be there. You guys need to figure out your stuff. And as I did this, first of all, I was a lot happier and I was feeling much better. And I watched as things shifted in my marriage and Matt started to realize I was okay and that I wasn't going to, once again, let his stuff and these things determine my happiness. He couldn't ruin me. He couldn't force our marriage to fail or like any of that. Um, and he started feeling safe to open up about some things and to be more true to who he was and set boundaries he needed to set. And I'm happy to say 10 years later, I have the marriage that I hoped for and that I'd seen the potential in, in Matt and I, um, and again, like, and a relationship with my stepkids that looks different than I thought it would, but is 
so beautiful and I love it. And again, like I have a different relationship with my stepdaughter than my daughter and a different relationship with my stepson than my stepdaughter. And like, it's all okay and works. I think often we feel like it has to look this one way or it's we're failing at it. It has to be this one thing or it's we're failing. And I've just come to realize in so many ways in my life that that's not true. It's just a bunch of bull crap that we feel <laughs> that we like convince ourselves of that this is the only way it can be to be right, for it to be perfect, for it to be like for it to be approved by our heavenly parents and God. Like, and it's just not. I don't believe anymore that there's just one right way for all of this to look. So there's the uh the long short version of my story. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, when you tell it, I know you're trying to condense everything and, you know, uh, this podcast would go on forever if we didn't. So you you have to breeze through some stuff. So one thing that I did want to go back to, because we didn't talk much on like your processing as far as you going through the healing journey for yourself, because you you are a great support system for him in that way of like, I know this about you. We're best friends in this area. I know this is what you need to do, but can you talk for a minute on what was going on inside of you and picking up those pieces and single parenting for a little bit or um, still like, what did that look for you in the, in the church world? And and with your faith, did that really just shake that up? So Can you just give us a little insight on walking through that for any women? Because I know specifically some women that listen to our podcast that they are on the, Mm -hmm. you know, it it happened to them necessarily their life. And it was a choice that they are making. Mm -mm. Um, It's always interesting. They always say divorce is two sided. Like there's always two sides. And I do believe that for the most part. And also when your partner comes out and you decide to get a divorce because he's gay, it's like. I couldn't have done anything about that. Like (laughs) there's nothing I could do. Um, So it's a little weird in that moment. I always like people try to compare their timeline to mine. And I'm like, none of these timelines can be compared of how we heal and how we process through. I had five years, technically six and a half, but five years when my husband could openly admit to me, he was gay, that I was married to him to process through kind of that part of it. And understand that this was very much not about me. And so any of the decisions he made within that, which were hurtful and hard, um, and I felt those things, and sometimes I was pissed and sometimes I was angry, I was also really able to come back to this fact of who I was and that this wasn't about me. And also what I knew Steve really felt for me. And I'm always hesitant with this because there's a difference when it's an abusive relationship or like a toxic relationship of how we navigate this, because sometimes people feel that and they'll use like me as justification. Well, but you stayed. And I'm like, I wasn't being verbally, mentally, sexually, physically abused in any way. Uh, And that's something I stayed very aware of. Like, am I closing my eyes to something that I need to be aware of? It was a conscious choice to stay in a relationship that I knew might end someday. So I processed through that um, with support groups, uh, with a few, I had a couple close friends and honestly, they were in support groups with me to kind of like, that was my support system when we were married that really helped me heal and understand this isn't about me and to, and to come back to that realization. I also got very good at trusting my gut of knowing when Steve had something that happened, it wasn't right in our relationship. I remember... I was on vacation when he had the affair. Penny and I were at a family reunion. And I remember when I got off the plane and, you know, walked out through security or whatever. And Steve standing there, like I saw him and I instantly knew something was wrong. I'm like, and I don't know why. There was nothing like in his, like him that was different. There was nothing. But I knew something had shifted in our relationship. And I think we discount that a lot of times. And that makes it really hard to heal when we continue to discount what we're feeling or what we know to be true and instead allow somebody else to tell us, well, no, you don't really feel that or no, that's not right or whatever. And we believe it instead of believing ourselves, it really shuts us down um, and makes the healing process incredibly difficult. And that's okay. Now we know we get to understand that and move forward with that. 
So I had that process. I mean, going through divorce and being single, there's so many things that you process through that are hard to carry, that are heavy. And I I went on a lot of long runs where I'd call my parents and I'm like, I need to drop Penny off for a few hours. And they'd be like, okay, bring her up. And I'm so grateful I had that. But I always tell people, find somebody that you can say, hey, I need an hour, two hours, three hours away from my kids in this process to just go do whatever. Maybe it's sleep, maybe it's cry, maybe it's go for a run, like whatever speaks to you. Um, And so I took time to do those things. I really tried to stay in tune with what it was I needed. Boundary wise, some days I could listen to Steve tell me things or help support him and carrying his emotions. And other days he would like try to open up to me and I'm like, I can't today. And he would I understand that. That's fine. But like, I can't hear this right now. It's crushing me. I always tell people, don't get the details of affairs. Don't get the details of those types of things. It 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 really destroys you in a way that's so hard. Um, and I've helped many a woman walk through that process of healing that, but it's just hard. It's harder. Um, there's just a lot of time of understanding what I need. I hardly worked at all. I I was offered several jobs, but I knew emotionally I wanted to heal and that that was the most important thing for me. So I shut off like, like I will get by on this much money and I will figure it out. And I did for the whole time I was single because I knew I needed to heal and I really wanted to be with my daughter still. She was two. And so it was really just important to me that I'd been a priority and I somehow made that still a priority and made that work. So I think like understanding those things and acting on them, even though sometimes they don't make sense, like it didn't make sense for me not to get a full-time job. Like I had a degree, I was good at working, but also it made sense for what I needed emotionally and physically. And we discount that. Like we're like, oh, but that's just dumb. Or people be like, well, you should be making money. You should be whatever. There are ways to figure out what it is you need. And some people need to be thrown into work. Some people need that as like a, healthy-ish distraction along the way. So there's some of the things I did to heal. Now, touching on the faith part of this, I uh, didn't, my beliefs evolved over the years. I mean, starting when Steve told me he had the pornography issue, I thought that was a one and done, like, no way I'm not putting up with that in my relationship because of what I'd been taught. And I realized there was a lot more to it when I was in that situation and, and so my belief shifted a bit in that moment, my belief shifted again, when he came out to me as gay, and understanding how I felt about that and getting clear on what I actually did believe, like, what if this was my son? What if this was my daughter coming out to me? How would I feel? How do I want them to feel? How do I want my friends to feel? I want them to be safe. Like, I want them to feel safe coming out to me. That's really important to me. And so my belief shifted a bit at that point. But my my commitment to my religion and my faith didn't shift in those moments. They've started to shift a bit more in the last probably three to five years. Um, I'm still very active in my church. I, I am the teacher of the women in my church. I like show up, I do the things. And also there are things that no longer serve me that I no longer believe. Um, but I don't think I was ready for that until this point in my life. I think it was probably there, but I wasn't ready to carry that load, that emotional load of having to upheave one more thing in that moment. Some people just do it all in one sweep and that's amazing. For me, it's been a very gradual process of you know, understanding what I truly believe, understanding what parts of my faith and religion do speak to me and which parts I've just realized aren't like, don't resonate with me. Uh, understanding that heavenly father, like God had a plan for me and all this. And I've known that from day one of dating Stephen, when we got married, like I had some very powerful spiritual, spiritual experiences that have affirmed to me that Steve's supposed to be a part of my life. And I still believe that very much like this was intentional and I think part of that is to be a voice for some of his children that we that feel like they don't have a voice within religion. And so I think that's been part of my process in that and part of my calling in life. Yeah. And so I asked um, before we started recording, though, before as far as Steve, he has stepped away from it. Is it because of 
the way that he was treated or he just changed his beliefs or he doesn't feel like he can believe and still live the lifestyle? Like what? I mean, I know you can't speak for him completely, but could you just talk a little bit on that? Yeah. And it's interesting because people will be like, they'll be like, well, you can't say what Steve feels. And I'm like, go listen to our podcast and hear how Steve feels because we've had these conversations ongoing from day one in our relationship and through divorce. And we have them currently on a regular basis about what we believe and where we're at. And um, Steve, I don't, I don't think he was ever treated poorly. From what I understand and what he shared with me, he was very blessed and he'll say this, that he never had church leaders who were mean or who made him feel worse or any of those things. He didn't have people who were out blatantly mean to him, which is unique. I mean, I don't think that happens a whole lot when you come out in a Christian religion. Um, you're going to be met with love from some people. And then there are people who are very vocal about the fact you're going to hell and that you should be ashamed and all those things. Like there's a whole thing that comes along with that. And I've seen that whoosh via social media for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so that part of it, Steve didn't have, which I am so grateful for. He did carry so much shame and guilt that there was no way in his mind to be able to reconcile these two parts of who he was. And so he had to let one of them go for his own mental health because of the shame, because of the guilt, because of the pressure he felt that he was innately wrong within the church. He couldn't separate those two. Steve is very much like a black and white thinker, like it's black and white to him and so he couldn't exist in a gray area and left the church uh and so and honestly watching him that's been the best thing one of you know a healing things for him is to be able to create the space for him to be able to love himself and um and that wasn't found within religion for him he tried several other religions and he's like you know what? i think i'm just i'm just done okay yeah i was just curious on that if he's Cause like, I know you said you had like this, you know, a spiritual experience where there's no doubting. And I know for myself, um, when I have encountered Jesus at some of my darkest, hardest points and experience what it is to be loved and the grace and the mercy, just, um, overwhelming that there's no denying like what, what is real <laughs> there. But for some, you know, it's, if, if you have been just trying to do like I did for so long, um, and like you were doing in your second marriage as well, when you're trying to do all the things and juggle everything and be perfect, um, and it's more religious and law based and all of that, that there can be that confusion because you mm -hmm. never feel good enough. And so a last question I wanted to ask before, and I'm definitely gonna have to have you back on Jessica, because I, I love just how y'all do life, you know, and the excitement mm -hmm. of that. And I want to be able to talk about all of that as well. Uh, but for time's sake, I do want to ask, as far as would you say it was harder? Because listening to your story, it seemed like your marriage was a lot more difficult in the one you were in now and blending, not even anything to do, or maybe it was part to do with your past relationship, but even just um, him and, and your your husband's past relationship. Was that a harder thing to go through as a wife than your first marriage? For me, yes. Like the blending of families, I was not, I'm going to say prepared for, which none of us are. I don't think there's any way to really prepare somebody for going into this, except that now there are podcasts and people talking about it and saying like, this is hard. It's not just this easy, beautiful thing. And it can look so different. I think if I'd been able to dive into some of that and hear so many, like a bunch of different stories before Matt and I got married, it might've prepared me a little bit better for what, what was going to happen and how I could navigate this and whatever. Not that I regret any of it. Like we have grown and um, let go of control. I think life is an ever like learning process of how to release control. Um it was harder for me. And I lost myself more in my second marriage than I did in my first marriage, which is so interesting to me when I look back on it. But it, it was just so like immediate that the shift happened. And 
I think that's kind of part of trauma is when it's like an immediate shift that we're like, what just happened? And so it was really hard. Um, and also, I mean, the greatest joys come out of those things, I think. Not that, and again, I do not encourage anybody to stay in a relationship just like based off of what I'm saying. You have to do what feels right for you. For me, it was right to stay. Other people, no, and that's okay. Neither of them's a failure or wrong or right. But I think I've I've tried to decide why it was harder. Like I said, I think it was partially just because I didn't have any idea. I didn't have time to process. I didn't whatever. Like we just jumped in. We thought we knew what we were doing. And now looking back, I think um, also with that is I had time to process my divorce. I didn't have time to process what we were getting into. And so, yeah, it was, it was hard. I, I wonder too, if it has anything to do with like in your first marriage, you were able to be like, you were you, you were a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and you were doing a fantastic job at it and loved for it, regardless of, you know, what took place and the decisions that Matt made after that, but then, or Steve, right? Steve was yeah. your first yeah. husband. Um, but then with Matt, no matter you being you or you being everything to everybody, whatever, it still was not enough. And so you kept yeah. trying to to do something outside of that. So that's really interesting. And there's uh, so many more dynamics too, is one of the other things I was thinking about. Like there's so many other people at play. You have a kid now that you're worried about. You have, like, there's so many people influencing directly your relationship where Steve and I it was just Steve and I, because nobody else knew what we were going through. And so we were the only ones impacting that relationship. So once I shut out everybody else, basically, and got clear on what I needed in mine and Matt's marriage, that's when things started to heal. Yeah. And I agree that I, I know, and I attest like my mistakes in my parenting, my first marriage, and now in my second marriage, when we were struggling was the judgment of other people and trying to make all of my decisions based on what I thought everybody else would make, would think I'm a good mom or I'm a good wife or yep. I'm, you know, I'm good enough. And so when I was able to say like, okay, that's, that's not, that doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what yep. they think it's okay. What does this look like for me? Um, so one question that I want to ask before we wrap up and you share how people can get in contact with you I've been starting to ask this is what is something in your blended family that y'all enjoy doing either with you and the kids or as a whole family or as a the real blend, all of y'all together? Yeah. What, what do y'all have the most fun doing? We love playing games together. Like I love that it's such a basic thing, but it's fun. Matt and I and the kids can all sit down and just have fun playing games together. And it's for the most part, a really good humor like people are kind to each other and there's good teasing not teasing that's leading to tears and things like that so I'm always grateful that for that and honestly as the kids have gotten older going on vacation together has been really fun which has been shocking to me that we actually have fun going on vacation together but I think that's because of the you know the kids aren't together all the time and so it has been fun like there's space away from each other and so this coming together is fun and exciting again and it wasn't early on. So now I love, I love those two things. So is there a favorite yeah. game that y'all have that you recommend? Um, we love taco goat cheese pizza. I don't know. It's a card game and it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, that's been one of the favorites for a couple of years now. So yeah. I haven't played that yet, but I have like looked into it. We did a podcast on like 10 new games like coming out. Yeah. So I did a little research on that one. It sounds, we just it's played tacos. Taco versus burrito. Have y'all played that? Oh yeah. We are uh, making like ridiculous, yet. nasty stuff. So yeah, we just played that the the other yeah. night. So we'll have to try out the one. I like asking those questions because, you know, families have fun in different ways. And we believe that mm -hmm. when you can find these things that y'all all enjoy doing, then it really just creates those bonds and those memories and helps you blend more. I love that you mentioned vacations because we can't go on vacations all the time every month. But to be very active and like proactive and planning and what you need to do. We for so long gave up 
vacation time because yeah. we're very involved in the church. And so any of our vacations were, um, you know, vacation Bible schools or doing summer mm -hmm. camps with the church and uh, mission trips. And we missed out on doing these family bonding things together. And so we like to be a voice on that as well. Like, yes, volunteer, you know, but also your family needs time together to be able to create these moments and these memories. So thank you for sharing those ideas. And so where can people get a hold of you if someone um, is walking through this in their life and they need someone that has been there, done that? I know you do like even retreats, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that look like if someone's listening and they're like, I need more of what Jessica has? Yeah, you can come find me at husband or sorry, husband law podcast is one place. I'm on all of the podcasting platforms. Start with episode one. Uh, we share our stories chronologically, so you'll want to go listen to that if you want the whole scoop of everything, mine, Matt's, and Steve's experiences. And then uh, Instagram, I'm hey Jessica Fru. But if you were like, I need some support now, please go check out. I have a free workbook that you can get. It's called Trusting Your Gut After Betrayal, Any Form of Betrayal. And you can pick that up for free at theboldlogic.com forward slash free workbook. I do coaching. I do group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. I host retreats. There's the whole group of women. I call them my unicorn herd because we've had this super unique experience, but we all come together to feel loved and seen and supported just like a herd would. So you can come check those things out. Um, I don't know when this is airing, but in February, I have a free workshop coming up. If anybody's interested in that, we can stick that in the show notes as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this episode will be out um, next Monday. So um, perfect. that so, should be perfect time. The workshop is a great place to start. I only offer it twice a year. It's completely free. And also I share, that's when I open up group coaching and it's the only time I only open up group coaching twice a year too. So you can get on, on that now. Okay. Awesome. And I'll put that workbook. I'll go find that or you send it to me and I'll get that in the I'll show. I'll send you all too. the stuff. So that y'all can just click on that and get that information and get started on your healing journey and process. But yes, go follow Jessica on Instagram so that you can get that just in your feed. I think sometimes when we find the support like this and you get it in your feed, the algorithm starts working and then you it helps remind you that there is hope. You are going to get through this. Yes. You do get to choose the kind of future you have and the kind of family you have. And you can make it a beautiful one. You can make it a fun one, even when you walked through um, some tragic events in your life or things have happened to yep. you in your life. You get to choose what you do moving forward with that. And so this here is just another great resource for anyone that's walking through this. So Jessica, thank you so much for coming on and being a voice um, for our community as well and speaking life and encouragement into them by sharing your story. I know they all appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, yes. And Blended Family Community, BFAM out there, if there is anything else that um, I can do personally for you in this or help connect you with Jessica, let me know. As always, we love you reaching out and saying thank you. Um, if this meant something to you or leaving some sort of review or send us a DM and just let us know how it was speaking to you. And in the meantime, remember to enjoy your blended family. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this episode has been a blessing and encouraged your family journey. Make sure you stay connected with us and join our weekly blended family newsletter. We send an email out every Friday morning full of support and encouragement. And when you join, we also want to give you a free gift. So go get yours today. The link is in the show notes below. Have an amazing day. Remember to enjoy the journey with your blended family and we'll see you on the next episode.